Welcome to Theology Thursday. I want the record to show I did not say okay in an aggressive way. Isaac's got another um, sponsorship attempt. You want to let the people know what you're drinking and why you're You know, like we have a so very much? special guest today, uh, but before we get to him, we've talked about his love for Zevias before. Mm-hmm. But what he doesn't know, he doesn't know about this, man. This is Zevia Kids. Okay. Zevia Kids. This is how you get the, the next gen flavors because otherwise they're just boring, like like cherry or lemonade. But with Zevia Kids, you get the hybrid strawberry lemonade. Strawberry. You know, if you're seeking sponsorships, you should do a better job of showing the front of the label to the camera. <laughs> That's good. Strawberry lemonade. You got a second flavor back there. Is that for halfway through the do interview? Do you want this one? This a- is Donald Duck orange cream. Zevia. I mean, I'll drink it, but look, were you planning on drinking both of them? No, you can have okay. it. Okay. I talked a lot of smack about Stevia last week, but. Now that I want him to it's sponsor Zevia. me. Stevia is this, the artificial sweetener. Totally. No, that's, okay. what, it, okay. that's what I was talking smack okay. about. I haven't tried Zevia. I just let, let the record show I stuck up for <laughs> Zevia, man. Hey, if you'll sponsor me, I'll change my feelings about your sweetener in a heartbeat. I can be bought and I'm not expensive. When it comes now, to the this. guest we have on today loves this. So that's much true. so that he my daughter used oh. her own money to buy a six pack of Zevias and she split them and she gave me three. And then she said the other three are for, for our Dan guest today. Kimball. That's amazing. And I'm assuming she learned about his love for Zevia while watching theology Thursday yes, from the weeks before. Yeah. She's probably our only <laughs> consistent watcher who's under the age of 10 and we love having her here. Hey, hello everybody. We should, we, we got a bunch of people in the chat already talking. Um, so good to see you guys. As people are already talking about, we have Dan Kimball. We're going to bring him on in just one minute. Yeah, we're giving him fake applause already. That applause is meant to symbolize the applause of everyone in their homes. Yeah, absolutely. So as we said last week, um, Dan Kimball came out with a book this year called How Not to Read the Bible. Um, it is absolutely incredible. I read it. I love it. It's um, well, well, we'll wait till we bring Dan on so I can butter his bread with him here. But um what we're going to be doing is launching a series where we kind of go through the various subjects tackled by this book. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are some of the most important, significant questions for Christians and non-Christians to be wrestling with in the modern world. So really thrilled to be starting this series. And Dan agreed to join us to open the series by answering some questions about the book and his thought process behind it. Steve gold in the chat. Wow. We got, we got a lot of people in the chat today. Yeah. Steve gold in particular though. That's a, It's a big deal. That's a big deal. All the way from Bakersfield, California. All right, cool. Should we bring in our guest? Bring him in. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only pastor, author, apologist, friend of the church. Ninja. Ninja. Dan Kimball, everybody. Hey, hey. Give another round of fake applause, Kevin. There we go. I don't know if you can hear the applause, Dan, but that's for you. Yes, I can hear it. All right. So I was I was starting to to talk about how much I love the book, but I wanted to make sure that you were here to, to you know awkwardly react to me talking about how much I love it. I I am a Bible guy. I love the Bible. Um, we talk a lot on the show about how we don't want to sanitize the Bible or pretend it's not weird. And so when I started reading your book, within just a few pages, I was like, the combination of accessibility, just in terms of the the casual voice that you write it with. It has tons of visuals, very easy to read, but truly seminary level depth is pretty unbelievable. Um, Your stuff on the law, on the Bible and science and a bunch of other stuff, you're dealing with stuff that is incredibly complex. Some of the most complex stuff we have to deal with when it comes to biblical interpretation, but it's in a way that anybody could read it and understand it. So hats off to you. I think I'm going to be giving this book away and um, recommending it to people for years to come. So first of all, just love it. Excellent job. That's not fake. That's not fake flattery either. That's That's what he told me privately. I did. He was like, this is, this is the book, man, that I'm going to give to, to that can looks like super tiny. Smaller. It just looks like, yeah. Show me Kevin. People need to see me drink this can. That's orange cream, orange cream. Do you see what I have here? Oh Oh, man. The cola's. Zevia. In fact, I even have two. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's root beer. You can't be over, you know. The likelihood of us nope. being sponsored just went through the roof when Dan Kimball showed the yeah. Zevia. Well, here we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, cheers. The sound is perfect. That is. A thousand cheers. people just cheers had to take South a... Valley. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Dan. Church. Thank you for being here. 
So again, I, I really mean it when I say I think this is a book that for years and years I'm going to be recommending and buying for people. Um, so before we talk about kind of the book and your thought process behind it, um, I know that your background and kind of how and when you came to faith in Jesus informs your view of the church and Christianity and the Bible quite a bit. So if you don't mind, could you share just a little bit about how you went from, you know, agnostic punk rocker to apologist, doctorate holding theologian, pastor, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, I was, um, all right. The quick version is I think God works in, um, he sees people that are seeking him out and he drew me into wanting to know more about him. As soon as I, one day, um, when I was in college, I had a question about do all paths lead to God? It was kind of one of these uh, sort of moments when you are wondering uh, about Christianity and if it was valid or not. And I didn't grow up in it. I grew up in Pramus, New Jersey, suburb of New York City, very close. You could see New York City from one of the streets right near my house. And uh, my parents were, uh, I would say like we were deists. We believed in probably like there's God, but you know, not much more than that. I wasn't atheist or anything. But it was in the college years when I started questioning uh, Christianity, because I saw Christians, and I was reading some of their literature that they're passing out on campus, and I began wondering, is this valid? Uh, a particular tract that actually I read about in the World Religions book was something that set me off, the World Religion section, I mean, uh, set me off on wondering, do Christians really claim that they're the only world faith, and how, I mean, the only way to God, and how crazy that sounds? And it just got me exploring things more and more, um, I had no one trying to witness to me. My parents weren't saying anything. And that's why I really do think it was God drawing me to him, you know, his spirit moving, because I was saying, is this stuff real? Is there God? And I was just an earnest uh, seeker, to use that word. And um, But this is what I remember. And this is a, it was a very important moment that probably none of my friends can even recall, but it was a big moment, which... Uh, in its way, set a trajectory for the rest of my life, and is kind of part of the origin of this book and many other things I do, was that as I was beginning to search out Christianity in my college years, and I bought a Bible, um, I bought, uh, starting to buy a couple of books to wondering, like, I remember I bought one about world religions, and one about, you know, how do you know what the, where the Bible came from, and I walked into my house, and my friends were there, and it got really quiet. And I remember they were like, you could tell they were talking about me. Oh, wow. And I, and, uh, and I'm like, what, what's going on? And they're like, we're kind of worried about you. And I'm like, <laughs> what? And we got into this talk that was sort of like an intervention, but it wasn't planned. Uh, and it was kind of like, I, we're worried that we see you with this Bible and you're starting to read these Christian books. And, you know, we're worried that you're going to be joining a cult yeah. because, you know, when you think of Christianity from the outside, it's often thought of like a, I mean, I think more and more, uh, especially evangelical in the good meaning of the word Christianity is going to be seen more and more like a cult in our culture. I just yeah. think it's going to happen because you don't, people don't, you know, we're, we're really beyond what people know about Christianity and the church and the story. And it sounds very, very cult-like if you're really examining it from the outside, but it's not a cult because we can question everything. There's no sense of, uh, that's, we're, we're totally not a cult by the yeah. definition of a cult. But back to that, you know, they were saying you're going to lose your creativity. Uh, you can't be thinking for yourself. And these type of things really stuck in my mind because I'm like, well, how do I know they're not true? Like, how do I know they're not right? Is Christianity simply a product of growing up in, at that time, it was suburban Colorado when I was going to school. Is you know, Do people just adopt their parents' beliefs? Is it just the predominant uh, religious faith of uh, America and the suburbs overall, so we just kind of adopt it? And that really haunted me, and that is what got me, from that moment on, I'm always like, how do I know this is true? Mm. Uh, I never forget looking in from the outside at church and Christianity to see, is this, is this, uh, you know, is it a cult? Is it, how do I know my friends weren't right? And, you know, that's kind of a, which got me into faith, kept studying, ended up going to uh, London, England, playing in a punk band, punk and rockabilly band over there. And an 82 year old pastor, long story, but, you know, took me under his wing that I happened to meet there because I was still searching, learned about God's grace, the gospel, put my faith in him, came back to the States, got involved in a church because I wanted to keep learning and eventually went on staff, went to seminary, Western seminary, where 
I'm on staff now, and Isaac's teaching as well. And uh, and and that kind of led thematically to this this particular book with the questions from the outside. That's great, and and it's uh, it, for people who are interested in that. You detail that story in in greater depth in your book, Adventures in Churchland. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, it's uh, um, Adventures in Churchland came out a couple of years ago, and it's more of a memoirish type of book, but also addressing the issue of what is church. What is, uh, you know, is Christianity a fundamentalist and those kind of things? So if you want to hear more on what Dan just talked about, plus a bunch of super funny stories, in my opinion, I, I recommend that book too. Yeah, Dan and I both have, have been told by people that if we're going to be involved in ministry, that we needed to have uh, a haircut. That's and true. We both share that. <laughs> That's true. And people well, were telling the truth I mean, to well, you Isaac, and lying to I mean, them. I met, yeah. I don't, what was it 10 years ago we met? I don't know what it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, and what, what I lost all track Isaac, of time you know, serving over at youth ministry over at, at your church and you're doing the young adult ministry that was meeting across the street in what I think now is a bank or was a bank or the library, mm-hmm. that first one. Yeah. Yeah. And then we met there and I'm like, who is this guy? And you're not only like a musician, you had a cool look about you, but man, you're a wicked smart. And I just remember like, who is this young guy that's like wicked smart and culturally understanding and a church leader. So I think we uh, gravitated towards you instantly. You know, Kevin knows Isaac well enough to know that he had to put the camera fully on Isaac to react to that compliment because Isaac doesn't know how to receive compliments like that. But yeah, you guys definitely bond over having unique hair, something I don't get to participate in. Um, But yeah, and you two, we should mention most people, many people, I should say, already know this, but Dan and Isaac and also Jay Kim, who's been on the show, Mm -hmm. are the leadership team for the Regeneration Project, which is a a, a nonprofit that kind of does apologetics for new generations. So, yeah, which is really, I mean, in one sense, the book is sort of like it's in the same exact stream of that whole ministry of trying to have legitimate answers to difficult questions, but in a culturally relevant way. Um, or as you said, in a way that's accessible yeah. because there's, there's, there's a big gap of like super rich, thick, robust theological responses. And then like oftentimes really shallow kind of responses in that middle area where most people spend their intellectual life is right. just, is just missing. Yeah. And, and that's the thing I noticed is as I was reading the book, I, I kept seeing things where I'm like, I, the only place you read about this is in the most academic discussions of the Bible and hermeneutics and not at the popular level. So, yeah, I mean, this is the unique nature of, and this is to Dan kind of keeping his pulse on culture, the pulse of culture, but it really is a response to memes. Right. And people don't realize how important like the memes are. It's like, I always say whoever wins the meme war wins, you know, wins, wins, the, wins, the, wins, wins the, the war. war. Yeah. Um, and that's how, that's how the communication takes place. And in one simple picture with one simple line, there's a gotcha statement. Yeah. Um, and even on the cover, there's sort of pictures of those gotcha statements. Yeah. That's, that's a question I wanted to ask you, Dan. We can do that now since Isaac brought it up. Um, I, I think the memes truly are one of the most brilliant elements of the book. And it's not just like actual internet memes against Christianity, although there's tons of those. You use like the language of meme culture in your positive arguments too. I remember you talk about Exodus 34, six as God's pinned tweet that mm-hmm, he's, that mm-hmm. he, and I, I, when I saw that, I was like, that's so, that summarizes what Exodus 34, six and seven is in a nutshell without having to explain yourself. So wh- where did that idea come from? Where, what's the significance of memes in your mind and why did that kind of become part of the central form of the book? Yeah, well, this book was written uh, um, from being in ministry and uh, talking to both young people, being online and, and, and uh, observing this keep uh, resurfacing over and over is we are in a meme, you know, short uh, tweet, you know, uh, that shapes tweets that shape beliefs, you know, and information being given out that almost sounds like it's authoritative from something very short and it, and it's shaping people's thinking. So it's not just like, you know, fun memes that there are some of those, but some of them are actually creating uh, definitions and understanding understandings of God, faith, Jesus to people from these short little memes with, with, uh, you know, either Bible verses or other statements about Christianity on them. So it was basically just looking at what is shaping people's thinking and wanting to give an apologetic for those today, since they're just so widespread. And the date, and well, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the difference what's going on today 
is, you know, being in ministry now 30 years. So I'm like been in ministry 30 years on, on staff at churches in the same town. So gotten to see trends come and go and different things happening. And I would say like, uh, first the church had to be sort of start, um, changing, you know, we, we were disconnecting to music and we we're disconnecting with style and those type of things. And so then the church began readopting to, uh, stylistically, you know, distant things to see new generations understand it. Then it was sort of, uh, about attitudes. The Christians are judgmental or they're associated with politics or, uh, all of their, those type of things. And, then we started addressing those things. And I think today it's getting to the heart of the issue is that it's it's the Bible which is being put under suspicion and being put under mockery uh, and being put under using the Bible to disprove the Bible. Mm. And what's going on today, and this is the alarming part, is if you don't know the Bible and you're only seeing little bits of the Bible, then certainly it's going to seem very convincing and I think we are in a time period where so many people, especially the younger you are, even if you grew up in churches, you don't know the Bible too well. And these verses are catching people off guard, seeing clever memes with, say, a slave in chains and then a Bible verse, you know, saying, you know, slaves, obey your masters. How can that happen? Or women with their mouths taped shut and saying, women, be silent. You know, go. it's a disgrace for a woman to speak in church. And then seeing actual Bible verses with these images is quite confusing to people because it is Bible verses and right. they look very convincing. And this was written like, we got to address this because people are actually starting to believe it, have uh, their faith deconstructed as, as you know, and, uh, and it's, and, and there's answers, there's responses to these things. And that's why I wrote this. Yeah. The, the uh, sad, the sad thing is, and this is why it's so effect, why the, well, the problem has been so prominent is that, you have people who grown up in church their whole life and they were never exposed to any of the difficulties, right. the difficult passages. Or they so, heard a misrepresented, sanitized version yeah, of the Yeah, or that's not what the story. Bible really says. And then you go to college or you look online, it's you see the meme and then you actually look it up and it really does say that. And then there's there, with that, there's a sense of betrayal too. Like, dude, they never, no one ever showed this stuff to me. Yeah. Um, and then oftentimes if you're a young person, then you're removed from the environment that you might possibly find answers if you're off to college or something. And then what's even worse is that because of the lack of theological education and biblical literacy, sometimes the leaders you turn to, yeah, that's the first time they're wrestling with that issue too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you, you talked about using the Bible to disprove the Bible, which is in my experience, at least a relatively recent thing to see. And you quoted at the beginning of your book, Penn Jillette, who's a famous atheist um, magician and just kind of public figure. And he said, reading the Bible is the fast track to atheism. And so you have that as an argument all of a sudden. That's how you, one of the things you start the book with is that quote. So wh what do you think he means by that? Um, and and what's, the, what's the kind of breakdown of how much of that is true that you could just read the Bible, like Isaac's saying, and become an atheist? And what's what's the way around that? Yeah, I mean, he uh, he is a, uh, you know, he's a smart, obviously funny fellow, and he um, he says this quite often, you know, he, uh, and this is pretty much repeated a lot. So this is him and many others that are saying, you know, Christians, if you really ever read your Bible, you couldn't possibly believe in it. And that is over and over and over again. And so what he says, if you, you know, he's got a show, a TV show, I uh, just watched it the other day again. In the beginning of it, he says, like, all right, I want you, anyone that's got a Bible, go get it right now. I'm going to wait here and go get it. You got it somewhere in your cellar or somewhere. And then he's like, now let's actually look what's in it. You probably don't realize what the heck is in this thing. You've had it in your house. You've never read it. Um, or Christians might read the good parts, but not the bad parts. And then he starts opening it up. And then he starts talking about, you know, there's a, um, you know, a talking snake in the beginning, that a, a rib woman there was slavery, there was God killing children, and he starts, you know, walking through all of these stories in the Bible, which then can be alarming if you've never really thought about those. And this is not just like, you know, an, an atheist saying this, this is really impacting people. I started the book off with a story, and I got permission from the guy who, uh, um, who wrote this letter, and he was involved up on, it's like a stereotypical almost story, a guy that was raised in a church here in the Bay Area, he ended up, uh, he was involved in the youth group. He was a worship leader, I think, in, in his church. 
he had a good relationship with his church. It wasn't a backwards church. They had good music. So it was none of these like the church is irrelevant or boring. He goes to UCSC here. I get an email from the campus leader and the campus leader said, hey, can you meet with one of my students? They're now saying that they're They've abandoned their faith, they're atheist, agnostic, and he gave a letter to explain why. They, with permission, the the leader sent me the letter, and then I read it and I meet with the student, and it was all Bible verses. It was all, I was in a Bible study reading Exodus, and I remember he said this, it's a great question, and he said, I'm reading how God killed the, um, the firstborn of the Egyptians, and, you know, like they deserved it and the kind of feeling we just kind of read that and keep going. But then he said it dawned on him. Why do we recoil in horror that Herod killed the under two year olds in, you know, in Bethlehem? Um, but then we see God doing the same thing. Why is it OK for God to kill children? And then Herod, it's we look at it as an evil act. And then he started looking at verses and he was listing them about slavery, you know, father selling his daughter into slavery, all of these different things. And then he said he typed online and he found a website called evilbible.com. And he said then it wasn't just those verses. He found 200 more verses and it began an unraveling of faith. And here's the part you said it earlier. He went to his mom and dad and he said he asked them questions and they didn't really have answers. It was kind of like, Oh, that's in there. Somebody must know, you know, and he's yeah. like, huh? Because here's your, your authority figures, your, your parents. Yeah. You inherited this And they this weren't able to even them. explain it or they didn't seem too bothered by it. It's kind of like, I accept it and then go on. Uh, then he talked to, I think it was his youth leader and he said, well, in heaven we'll find the answers. And he said he wasn't intellectually satisfied with the shallowness of the answers he was getting from the key authority figures in his life. And then he realized, I love them. They're great. I had a great church experience, but I can't believe in this faith anymore. And um, and that's the kind of story, when you start hearing deconstruction stories, you hear the same thing over and over again. And it's kind of amazing, especially if you're a worship leader or something that or you're in church for a while and you've never questioned this stuff. Like some of it, I always wonder, is there more going on behind these deconstruction stories than just this? But especially if you're an older person and you're maybe serving in church or whatever. But I do think it's valid and it's kind of undermining people's faith and confidence in the Bible. And that's, that's what's going on. So it's not just like theoretical comedians that are bringing this stuff up. It's affecting real, real young people's lives because they're not prepared to address or, uh, or, or when they see these verses, it just really catches them off guard. Yeah. And if the first person to bring those things to your attention is somebody who's in opposition to Christianity, you're in trouble, right? So that opportunity we have as parents and as church leaders with young people is often wasted to kind of introduce them to the difficult stuff. Yeah. I mean, think of this. If I grew up in a church today, I'm going, I mean, I've been thinking more about this, obviously, since I've been writing this book and everything. But I think if I grew up in the church, what are the lyrics in most songs? Like, God loves you, you're loved, which are really important. You know, you loved you, he died for you, you're saved, he loves you, you love you, you love you, we thank you for the cross, we love you, we love you, he loves you, he loves you. Chains uh, are breaking left cross. and right. You know, it's like, Break the chain. And then all of a sudden, like, <laughs> slavery? God was into slavery? God, God ordered the killing of these children? Um, you know, like, all of these women be silent? Like, all of a sudden, like, what's going on here? And, and I think... Uh, the more we, you know, there's some we can talk about. Here's an example. When I, when I actually, when I spoke at your church, I showed this uh, book cover, but this is kind of an example of it. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Awkward moments, children's Bible. And like, you know, on the back of this book, this was a, I believe a former youth pastor, if I recall this correct, because I talked to him once or by, we emailed once, I should say. Um, he says, our goal for this book is to get people to really read their Bibles and think for themselves. Mm. And then what he says is most people were raised in the faith by their family. Young kids learned a few Bible stories taken out of context, accepted them without rejection. And then he goes on to 55% of Christians can't even name the four gospels. And he says there, so what he does is he takes Bible verses like the one about Noah and the ark. And if you can see this on the video, for those that are watching this by video, Lift it up a, a tiny a bit higher. It's kind of humorous. It's a cartoon 
of Noah on the ark, and then you look at the water, and there's all these dead all bodies the dead floating. Bodies. Oof. So, like, but drawn in a whimsical called, children's. He does style. it like a children's book, <laughs> you know. And then, I mean, it's uh, it's done really well. I mean, it's like what I'm fighting against with this book, but it's you know, it's I understand it, and uh, um, but that's what he's trying to say. Most people don't know their Bibles. You start seeing these things, and it's confusing people. And if you really read it, you can't possibly believe, believe it. It's interesting because what he's telling people he wants, what he's saying he wants people to do is actually the same thing that you would say you want people to do. It's like actually read the Bible and take it seriously. Or, but you yes, believe yeah. that if you do that all the way, then you'll, you'll recognize that it's valid and believable. And that, that's one of my favorite things about your book is that um, even though it's, it's kind of at its core an apologetics book primarily for the Bible, your answers, it's kind of like you're, you're doing a judo move on the, the critique because the critique is, you know, you use the Bible to disprove the Bible or, hey, if you just read the Bible then you'll become an atheist. But your answers are not kind of abstract and philosophical. They're almost all from within the Bible. So you're saying if you just dig deeper and see how this fits within the whole kind of broader story of Scripture, then you'll you'll actually find that it's reasonable. It's not, not as crazy as it sounds. Was that kind of like having your answers come from the story of Scripture and from within the Bible itself? Was that a conscious choice from the beginning or did that just sort of shake out as you were going? Yeah, I mean, I think it basically... It's just trying to teach, you know, that's why the first section of this book uh, is basically on how not to read the Bible, because I do think many Christians and many churches, we have mainly focused on the positive stories and the positive verses, which we want to do, you know, and they're all there, and then we can bring them up. And then quite often, as you know, Christians and churches will take verses and use them out of context in happy ways. And they don't necessarily apply to us today, or the principles that we cling on to is promises for sure for ourselves, and they were never meant to be promises. And what's happening now is we're so used to those, and it's kind of been reading the Bible wrong when we pull verses out and use them that way. But what's going on now is the same thing the other way. Mm. The bad-sounding Bible verses are now being extracted out, focused on, pointed to with no context, not looking at where they are in the Bible storyline and all those other things. And so it's the same problem both ways. And if Christians aren't prepared to know properly how to read the Bible, they're going to be, they're, they're coming to wrong conclusions often in both the happy verses and also the wicked sounding verses. So it's kind of a Bible study methods book in disguise. Yeah. What's, what's interesting is, you know, we can go back and trace the historical roots of this, but e- essentially for many, many of the streams in evangelical culture, there has been a a movement away from the Bible. And you wouldn't think that that's the case. No one, no one explicitly says like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to hide from the Bible, but I'll give you an example. There are some worship artists who every lyric is pretty much directly from scripture. It's one of the ones that, that we like using here as citizens. I mean, you, you take one of their songs and it's like, you don't even know it, but actually every line in this is from it's just the Ephesians book of Ephesians two, yeah. chapter two. And it's like, and it's pounding scripture into your mind and you're singing it together corporately with the body. And then there's songs that just, as Dan said, you know, God loves me. I'd love to see his face. Oh, his grace is so amazing. Win the race. You help me win the race. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, and, and that, and, but, th- but then we do that with sermon series too, right. where sermon series are basically loosely connected principles that you kind of dug up from scripture. And there again, if, if don't hear me hating too much, there's a time and a place for those types of, there's a time and a place for a cotton candy worship song. But the way I always explain is it's what's your diet, right? So you can have in your Sunday service, a cotton candy worship song, a sermon series. that's pretty much just encouraging and it's go get them. Um, you have to treat that like, like dessert. It can't be yeah. the main portion of your diet. And so when you grow up and you can grow up in church and have all these sermon series and all these worship songs, as Dan said, just talk about how God is love and you're divorced from the Bible and Christians are people. We, we used to be called people of the book. Are we people of the book? And so what happens is you, you spend your whole Christian life, never being a person of the book 
and then you start to read it and you're just yeah. in a landscape that you do not, you, you don't even have a compass to navigate. Yeah. And that. people don't realize they're learning how to read the Bible from their church a lot of the time without even knowing it, that if you're taught and it's just one verse here, one verse there, th- that's how you believe you read the Bible. Yeah. And it's really the, p- the point you just made, Dan, that's so interesting to me that it hadn't occurred to me before is that when, when an opponent of Christianity cherry picks a Bible verse and throws it in Christian's face. They're using the Bible study methods Doing that most the same Christians. Thing. So it's sort of, it doesn't appear invalid to them because they're like, well, when I needed encouragement, that's how I received encouragement yeah. was here's a Bible verse taken out of its context and just yeah. cherry picked. So a cherry picked Bible verse that sounds bad is the same exact thing. You actually quote, um, you know, it's funny, Dan, for years I quoted you as having said this. And until I read this book, I didn't realize that it came from Greg Kokel eventually. But the quote is never read a mm-hmm. Bible verse. Um, which yes. I love. And it's so funny because obviously it's, it's meant to be tongue in cheek, but the point you're getting at there, or Greg was getting at originally is don't just read one Bible verse. Actually, Greg Kokel took it from me. Oh, did he? Yeah. It was one of my first published <laughs> works. Isaac is a nine year old. The first time Greg Kokel spoke at South Valley community it's church. True. It's true. <laughs> so yeah, we, on, along those lines, we'll just, I, I want you to do one of my favorite examples of this that actually came up in my life just a couple weeks ago. This is a true story. One of my friends who's reading the Bible for the first time this year texted me super late at night. It's like 11 o'clock. I'm in bed already. And he texted me and he goes, Sam, are there unicorns in the Bible? And I was like, like everything, this is a longer answer than I want to text right now. Um, but so I'll, th- I'll put the question to you because I don't know how many people who are watching right now are aware of this, but are there unicorns? Don't in the let Bible, me down, Dan? Dan. There better be unicorns. I'm hoping there's unicorns. Yes, there were unicorns, and the last one we had uh, alive before it died was in the 1700s. Oh, my gosh. In Cincinnati. So So, um, there were (laughs) unicorns. In Cincinnati in the 1700s. uh, uh, That's why we need to be more into (laughs) environmental protection because the unicorns died out. People don't know enough about Renaissance Cincinnati, first of all, just in general. That medieval Cincinnati was a hotbed of literature. <laughs> <Time for some laughs> <Zevia>. <laughs> so what's up with unicorns? Because if you pick up a certain Bible, certain <coughs> translations of the Bible, you will find the word unicorn in there, right? It's the King in the King James. It's King unicorn? James and a couple other ones, I think, and a few others. And and it's not just in one spot. There's like three or four places where there are unicorns. I think there's about eight or eight or nine. So what's going on with the unicorns? Yeah, I mean it's the same thing. This was a this was a, like a super easy one to solve. Not all of them are. Um, this easy, <clears throat> but I mean, as the guy that cuts my hair, uh, he's not a Christian. Then he actually asked me the same question: Are there unicorns? I was read. I saw online. I think it was Pinterest or somewhere. You take graphics of a unicorn, Bible verses underneath, and, then, and there's kind of a mockery. You believe unicorns are in the Bible. Up until that point, I had not seen that. So I, then I end up. I'm like, all right, there's got to be something going on. I don't recall reading unicorns in the Bible, and it turned out. That in the 1611 King James translation, there was a word that was pro- uh, a Hebrew word that was meant like a prominent one-horned animal of some uh, some sort. It's kind of like one-horned animal. The, the word actually means, and they didn't know how to translate it into English, so they used the word unicorn that developed into a mythical beast that we think of today. And now that's why in most translations today you see the word, word wild oxen because there was a prominent one-horned wild ox at that particular time where the Bible was written uh, from. So therefore, uh, that was most likely what it was. But it certainly makes a good meme to see the word unicorn quoted and then mocked. And if you don't know, like your friend or my barber, they say, hey, there's unicorns in the Bible, another way to make fun of it. Yeah. And the average person truly does not ever think well, I'm not like this wasn't even originally written in English. That's not a natural thought when you read a book in your home language. And so it's like the idea that there's a Hebrew word that then becomes a Greek word that then becomes the word unicorn. Um, that's just an extra step that most people wouldn't occur to them. Um, but it's a great example of the fact that like something that looks completely ridiculous on the surface has a really, really simple answer. That's not even yeah. that crazy. And for, for not certainly not all Americans, there's a portion of, of Americans that speak two, three, four plus languages. But um, because of our geographical context in the United States, when you only know one language, you didn't grow up having to, to learn how to do the conceptual work between languages. Yeah. So if you speak multiple languages, you often encounter stuff where you go, 
oh, the translation for that is, oh, no, that word doesn't work. I know it kind of sounds like it means the same thing, but trust me, culturally, you say that, that's not going to work. And so we're at a disadvantage because we just, we don't think about the ancient context and we don't think about the language context. So we just read Unicorn yeah. and go, well, that's weird. One of my East African friends, actually you and Kevin know him too, Sylvester from Tanzania, has a joke where he says, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? And you say trilingual. He says, what do you call someone who speaks two languages? And you say bilingual. And he says, what do you call someone who speaks one language? American. American. And all yeah. the Americans go, ugh. Um, so that, that actually leads me right into the next question I was going to ask you, Dan. You talk about cultural distance a lot in the book. And that's basically just the, the differences, like what Isaac was saying, between our world and the world of the writers and original recipients of the text. So what yes. do you think, if you're, if you're a modern 21st century Westerner, what are some of the greatest challenges you have in reading this ancient book? Yeah, well, something I wanted to say is I've also heard this criticism of me talking about, like, going into, the, why do you have to go into the ancient world? Mm. Why do you have to be spending the extra time? It's God's word. I don't need, I just need the Holy Spirit in me. Don't need to look into this. And then, like, oh, we don't need scholars to help us, right? And I want to, if there's anyone that does think that, and I know your, your church is pretty... Uh, uh, Bible savvy. You've know, been there many times. And so this is, I wouldn't think this is someone in your church, but when um, this is said, I always want to go to like, you're already dependent on scholars because it wasn't written in English. Right, so yeah. you already have people that have gone through interpretation processes that had to know culture and everything to put it into the English that you're reading it from. Because there is sort of a you don't need that kind of stuff. You just need to the word, just read it, it and that's it. And, um, and and you're just forgetting that there is so much cultural study done to get it into the English that you're even reading currently. And that's yeah. why we even have different translations, because there's some different biases sometimes in how you might translate it into English. But going back to your question was... Um, you know, the, one of the another key points for looking at the Bible, and this is I'm going to take a phrase from John Walton, who's a professor at Wheaton. The Bible was not written to us. It was written for us. And that's critical because when you go into Genesis, we want to immediately read that book through the lens of our modern day thinking and our modern day questions and try to get answers that Genesis was never meant to answer. Genesis was part of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That was written to the people of Israel after they were in captivity and slavery in Egypt, a polytheistic world for 400 years. They're now in the, heading into the promised land. God wanted to them know who really is God and those other gods aren't. And so he was trying to answer their questions that they would have had, not our modern day questions. The Genesis was not written to understand the fossil record or amino acids or the things that we want to get our answers for. And we have to remember that. So it always is, who was it written to? It wasn't written to us first. What was their worldview at the time? To say, I'm just using this for an example, you know, to an ancient Israelite, when they said the word earth, we think whenever we, th we think earth, we're, we immediately think of the view from outer space yeah. looking at earth. That isn't what they would think. They would just know what they saw visually and what they thought and heard about how, what, what they could see. And, you know, and there was a lot of work, uh, you know, that I took from John Walton and Tim Mackey and others that I put in the book about, you know, the ancient Israelite worldview. Um, when you're reading a book of Romans, who was it written to? It wasn't written to us. It was written to the Romans in yeah. their world. Who was Revelation written to? It wasn't written to us. It was written to seven churches that were starting to experience persecution, you know, in Turkey, modern day Turkey and other places. And they were in a world and in order to best understand the scriptures, we have to go into that world. And we're so trained to just read. This is poor, poor church leadership does this, where we, we've been using the Bible and then just saying, hey, what, we look at every verse. And then the first question we train people to think is, how does it apply in your life? Yeah, what does this mean and that's, for me? That's not the, what the Bible was meant to be uh, written. And we're going to get into all kinds of wrong wrong promises that we may hold on to and then be disappointed in God when we take a promise that wasn't meant to us. So we have to put effort into this. And that's why looking into the worldview of who the Bible was written to and, and, and all, all, through, all through the ages is really, really important. 
You know, it's funny. We do, we do this more automatically with stuff that's more recent. As Dan was saying all that, it, it occurred to me, I just finished reading for the first time because I was a homeschooler, <laughs> Crime and Punishment, which I'd never read before. Um, and I kept thinking over and over, I wish I knew more about Russia during this time mm-hmm. period. Because oh, like the stuff kept happening. And I was like, oh, dude, I'll bet that's really significant. But I have no idea what they're talking about because I don't know what the social movements were in Russia at when Dostoevsky's mm-hmm. set this story. And so that's only a couple hundred years ago. And in a, a nation that's much, much more similar to ours yeah. than ancient Israel or uh, first century Greco-Roman world. And so I, it's, it, I never made that connection until you were talking just now, Dan. But like we, I, we know when we read a Russian novel from a couple hundred years ago that some of the stuff is not going to be the same as it is here. And mm-hmm. when something seems weird, we go like, well, I'm sure that made sense to them, right? Um, but we don't do that same step for a book that is 10 times older and much, much more culturally different than ours. And, and I'll say the best way, obviously studying history, there's people, God has called, we're so hyper individualistic. We just think it's like, I should be able to come to all the right conclusions by myself. But God has has equipped people all throughout history. But then in your life, God has equipped teachers and leaders that spend their life studying this to help teach it. Um, but in addition to that, one of the best things you could do to learn the world of the Bible is actually just read the Bible so if you want to understand yeah. ancient Near Eastern culture, you can go and like, like well, well I, I've, that's what my degree, like I'm writing a dissertation on the world of Genesis. So you could do that, but you could also read the Bible day in and day out, and you will begin to think like the biblical authors. Um, so for instance, if you saturate yourself in the Old Testament, you'll understand Paul better. Totally. You just automatically will. Um, so a lot of the kind of conceptual world is already embedded in the text. And the more you read it, the more the more you'll be you'll become comfortable with it. The problem is, is we just read it once and immediately impose kind of our modern understanding. It was interesting. I was reading um, some of the church fathers um, yesterday, and Dan mentioned co- questions in Genesis, but Genesis day three and four, on four God creates um, the less the greater light and lesser light. Okay, so this kind of solar the the, the luminary bodies and the stars. Uh, day three, plants begin to start start to, to sprout. And um, some of the concerns of the first Christians was like, oh yeah, God did this to show that the plants, um, they they don't find their source of life in the sun. They find their source of life in God. Dang. And because, I mean, they're still in, in the first couple hundred years of Christianity. Sol Invictus, the cult of the sun, is like one of the major right. things Christianity is rubbing against. And so when they're looking at that text, they're going, oh yeah, this is all about showing that the sun isn't a God rather than, and what we're asking it is how does the precise chronology work? And it's not to say chronology is not important. Chronology, timelines, days, all of that matters. The question is for the original authors, what was the primary first intended meaning? Because that's what, and then when you deduce those things, you can actually come to then, how does this then work out in my life? Right. You just have to do the work to get there. Totally. And, and doing that work is how you protect yourself from, like Dan said, hearing a promise and thinking it's for you only to mm-hmm. be disappointed in God later. And like that kind of ground level problem. Yeah. And, and you talk about a lot of that stuff with Genesis 1 and 2 and, and the kind of creation story and the s- sorts of questions that would have been asked. And it, it leads me into a, a kind of a sub question of the last question I asked you, Dan, um, which is, what are the kind of guardrails or rules of thumb for knowing when am I reading something that kind of like is culturally controlled and I, and I should, I need to really, you know, know that this isn't for me because it's for a different time and place and knowing when something is kind of like transcendent applies to any time in any culture. How do you kind of, I know it's a long answer, but what's your kind of quick tips for that? Yeah. The quick tips, and actually I printed it out, was I do believe every Christian needs to, this chart's in there uh, for those that are watching on video. It's like a Bible, a simple Bible timeline, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like going through the the timeline of the Bible. And if we have that in our minds and we can basically, when we're opening up the Bible, we see, we can like visually realize it's a, it's a grand story that has a beginning and an end. Um, uh, and we want to look at whenever we're looking at part of the story, where in the storyline are we reading from? And then we can start making sense of like, okay, so maybe this was applying specifically to the Israelites and Babylonian captivity and is not God speaking us uh, for today. Oh, we look in the Leviticus laws. 
you know, and we have whole sections that you'll be going through and discussing this, but you'll see very strange things in Leviticus and these dietary laws and all of these, you know, don't eat shrimp or don't eat shellfish and don't touch the skin of a dead pig, don't eat ham, don't eat pork, like all of these things. So today, um, can we do that? And then you have to look through the, get the timeline, you'll realize those type of things are not what the New Testament onward, for those that have faith in Jesus, that we need to be practicing. And we have to put the effort in to see which passes through. But then Levitical laws, it also says don't murder. So does that pass through into New Testament time? Yes, it does. Jesus even sharpened it and said, you can murder people in your heart and with your words. So, uh, you know, so knowing the timeline, you then can start seeing that what passes through to New Testament time and our day-to-day lives today, and what were things that were specifically written for specific people in a specific time period. However, these are, I think I have a lot of memes in the, that, that section of the book yeah. that you know talks about all of these crazy sounding laws. And I just saw well, some celebrity, I just saw this like two days ago, uh, you know, quoting like, you, you Christian hypocrites, you eat shrimp, don't you? Yeah. And it was somebody famous, I forget who it was. And, and I'm like, there's an example. So they've, through pop culture, heard that the Bible says you're not supposed to eat shrimp. And then they're using it against contemporary Christians to, to say you're hypocritical if you're eating shrimp. They don't know the Bible storyline. They don't, they're not pi- applying anything. So they're, they're basically doing a meme. They've seen it. Now they, they're, they're coming across authoritative saying Christians shouldn't eat shrimp. And then most Christians go, I guess maybe they're right, you know, or if they're not recognizing these stories. You know, a lot of it, I use this example of knowing things that may sound strange to us today, but they knew what they were talking, what was going on in that time period. There are things that we still don't understand fully, but they would have when God was communicating to them in that time. And there's laws that were put in place in the United States at some point. And I use the one example, and these are still on the law books. I found these examples of strange laws that are still never been removed from contemporary law books in geographic areas in the United States. Yeah, they cracked me in, up. In Arizona, <laughs> there was a, uh, there's a, there's still a law like a donkey cannot be in a bathtub. It's illegal to put a donkey in a bathtub. Like, what a strange thing. Wasn't there one that was that like, law? you can't put a ice cream cone in your back pocket or yeah, something? Yeah, your back pocket, right. <laughs> and those were preventing heart, horse theft because some people were doing that at the time. <laughs> The donkey was, there was actually a guy that was keeping his donkey in a bathtub and a flood came, moved the bathtub and the donkey into some mud pit and it was so difficult to get it all out. They said, you can't do this anymore. They made a law. So to them, they understood it. Today, it sounds bizarre. That's a lot like the Bible. Most of these all had intention and purpose that would have made sense to the original people. But today we look at it and it sounds so bizarre and understandably bizarre because they are very strange but they made sense to the original people. So it's just poor usage of Bible understanding when people pull out these verses and try to like slap them on Christians today. Look at you stupid people. Can't believe this. It wasn't many of these things weren't meant for today. And that's putting in Bible study methods effort. And you asked me at the beginning, what's the best thing to do? Know the Bible storyline and you'll start naturally start thinking like this. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, you talk in the book about that really famous, it's a viral clip from the West Wing where yes. um, the President Bartlett, it's a show that I loved, the President Bartlett comes out and there's a Christian woman, like uh, some kind of Christian lobbyist or something, who starts throwing every single one of those Old Testament, or uh, rather, she's kind of like a moralistic, sort of presented as a puritanical type of figure. And President Bartlett starts throwing all of these Old Testament laws at her and talking about, you know, like, hey, my, here's how old my daughter is. If I sell her into slavery, what's a good price for me to ask for her? And, um, and that got shared. Like, do you remember when that was getting yeah. shared like crazy on Facebook? And, and the point you just made that's so important for Christians to realize is when people do that, they are just revealing what is essentially a, a literary ignorance, that you don't understand how this book works. Um, I mean, like, there's just part of me that goes, do you not think that all of the PhD Bible scholars in the world have thought about. Never thought like about that. They n- it never occurred to them to talk, to think Which, about shrimp. Yeah. and It shows you something of, of a sickness in our culture that's so widespread right now is we get th- this much of information on any given topic, this much on an incredibly complicated topic, and we arrogantly 
post a gotcha thing as yeah. if because we we looked at something for three minutes. And that's not just in, in the no, biblical world. I mean, it's, it's just like of our culture right now. And it's like, dude, we can be so arrogant to do three minutes of work and think that we're going to like punk, a, you know, billions of Christians throughout. Oh, I never thought about that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The saddest thing though is to kind of come full circle is that we have people who are growing up in church who really, I've never thought about that yeah. because they haven't been exposed. There was a... Um, Dan, you may remember this. There was it's probably like five years now, maybe maybe more, 10 years. Barna did um, a, a, a question for evangelical church going Christians who said they attend church regularly. And they asked them to, they asked them to put oh, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus in chronological order. Now, chat, don't, this is, if you don't know this, don't, don't feel bad. It just means you got work to do. Yeah. Um, but put, and this gets to your point of knowing the storyline of the Bible, put Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus in chronological order. And it was something, I mean, it's been so long, I don't remember, but it was tiny like percentage. The vast majority of Christians couldn't do that. And they, to Dan's they, point, that's not like an arbitrary, do you know this random Bible trivia? Understanding the sequence of no. events in the Bible is How old Melchizedek was is random Bible trivia. Dan, do you know that? Sam, do you know that? 69 years. Are you you're thinking of Methuselah, I think. Sorry, I met Methuselah. Oh. Melchizedek. I, I messed up. Melchizedek had, had we don't know nothing about that guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Methuselah, I sorry. I thought. Uh, uh, I know, because me and Dan yeah. think we're in the same way. Is that correct? I think so. I think it's just, I know okay. it's just under a thousand. The Me Melchizedek, what's his name? Um, Bird. Oh my gosh, Australian scholar. Michael, Michael, Michael Bird. Bird. Michael Bird always says, sweet mother of Melchizedek. Yeah, he does. <laughs> So that's random Bible trivia. But when you're talking about the narrative of scripture, that stuff's essential. Like Abraham is told to leave, leave your family behind. That's a command in scripture. Yeah. That probably not a command for, for you. Yeah. <laughs> type, and type it's, it's not a command that would have made sense for God to give to David. Right. So it's, so that stuff really, really matters. It, what you just said, Isaac, a minute ago, about the kind of like three seconds of study and then you feel like you know enough to punk somebody. Dan, you, you've spent all this time thinking about memes. This is something that has disturbed me for a long time, which is I don't know how Christians can respond using like this format of discussion. Because it seems like the answers that Christians have, the valid answers, require more explanation than a meme can give. So what do you advise people who are like seeing their friends or family members posting memes, you know, about shrimp or whatever kind of ridiculous things that require a, a lengthy answer. How do you suggest they engage with people when it's just this kind of currency of super snappy, quick communication? Yeah. I mean, when my barber, when my barber uh, asked me that question, I didn't have an answer because I had not yet seen the, the unicorns in the Bible memes. And uh, so I'm like, all right, I got to go find out. Like I had confidence there was an answer and then I went and you know researched it, found out there was an answer, and then I could get back to him next time I got my hair cut and said, okay, here's what it was. So I just think it means the Christian, you can't just like go throw up another meme and try to answer it with another meme type of a thing. We do need to be thoughtful, um, understanding that these, you know, I don't blame people for, um, for seeing the memes and getting confused, you know. Uh, but I, but you know, it's just this whole sense of like, we respond with our feelings, not the facts, right? That's kind of this whole world that we're in today. Yeah. We emotionally respond to something and we're not really looking at the facts behind it. You know, you mentioned that word, the story of the president, you know, Bartlett in that West Wing, what was really ironic about it was he was challenging the credentials of the, the speaker. She was a radio host. And, you know, do you have a PhD? And she's like in English literature. And he's like, oh, not in theology. And she's like, no. And then he starts with great authority, just like he is a professor in theology, right. quoting Bible verses. So he actually, it was kind of like a backwards. Yeah. And he's an economist, if I remember. Yeah, but he does it. I mean, that's <laughs> I the same thing. The you're, you're, it, if I was just watching that West Wing clip, I would be like, holy smokes, I didn't know that stuff was in the Bible. Yeah. You know, that what a... He's brilliant. He knows the Bible and the Christian doesn't know the Bible and yeah. I, the Bible's messed up. You know, I can't believe in this stuff if it's uh, has slavery and all of the different weird laws and the things that he brings up. I would be just watching that. I'd be uh, 
that's that's ridiculous, uh, ridiculous faith. But here's, we did this in our church. We actually, I don't know, seven years ago or something like that, at the end of a sermon, I forget what the series was on, but we actually showed that whole clip from beginning to end, put it up in our church, played the whole thing, and then said, okay, how the heck do we answer that? And then I'm like, come back next week. And so then we waited a week. You can just feel the whole thing like, ah. And then the next week we played it again. And then I walked through each verse, each of his criticisms, and then tried to demonstrate Bible study methods to show here's how we can respond to these things. Because there's going to be hundreds of these kind of weird verses. If we can just bring in confidence, that's what I tried to do in the book, was like to keep reinforcing Here's ways of looking at these. And then I hope by the end of the book, people also, when they get shocked by other ones, they're like, oh, there must be some sort of reasonable response to these Bible verses that I'm seeing pulled out and painting a God that is evil and wicked and 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 disturbing kind of Bible verses about all types of things. So I hope we have confidence that, oh, there must be some sort of reasonable answer. Let me think through it through the timeline of the Bible and all of those type of things. That's great. And I, I think one thing that emerges from your answer is how part of how you were able to talk to your barber is the fact that you have an ongoing relationship with this guy, right? So you go to the same barber every time. He feels com- comfortable to ask you a question and you're going to be back to, to answer him. And so it's you can't give those long answers to people who don't know you, don't trust you, don't have some sort of relational equity with you, right? Yeah, I mean, on, online you see all these kind of battles, you know, like uh, Zondervan, the publisher, actually, they've posted up a few little uh, um, ads for the book. You know, and they'll, <laughs> I've watched and it. I've seen some look at some of the <laughs> I'm like, oh my, like people just jump at it and then just start like ripping into me and different things. <laughs> and it's interesting, like, all right, how do I respond to, uh, you know, them ripping something? And then I'll, there, you have to also, there's some credible, you know, articles online that you can send to people, but it is really interesting how quickly people want to just uh, slam the scriptures or someone that believes in them or from these. They hate now, Christians because this. they're I mean, so just ju- was in Sorry, um, go ahead. an unbelievable. I was with Justin Briley and yeah. a guy named Michael, who is an atheist. And I wish I was more prepared because uh, he just jumped right to, you know, of all the things we could talk about, he jumped right into the most difficult, which I don't blame him, I guess, you know, the difficult questions. Why did God kill babies? And how can you believe in a God that instructed the slaughter of babies? And second one was about slavery. And, um, you know, those are the two, I think, the two most toughest things to talk about in the entire Bible. And I say that in the book, especially the violence. Yeah. Because you can't explain away, unlike the unicorns, you know, or unlike, you know, women be silent in the churches. There's those things that at a face value, they're not, um, they aren't um, real. You know, God, Paul was not telling women not to actually be silent in the, in the Corinthian ch- uh, church because three chapters earlier, he was telling them to talk and pray out loud. So yeah. like there's something more going on there. But what you will see with the violent passages when, when your church gets to that section, there are things that we have to just acknowledge that God chose to use violence in certain situations. And, um, and that is difficult. You know, it's the most difficult thing to, to um, you know, in other words, like, just like couldn't there have been another way? You know, yeah. and I think... If there was another way, he would have done it. But that was a barbaric, you know, culture that we can't understand. There was warfare, and as I explain, you know, there's war rhetoric. It wasn't just randomless slaughter. It wasn't merciless slaughter, and they killed every single person. It was an extinction. It wasn't genocidal, race based, or any of these accusations like that. But there were times when infants likely were killed, just like in a battle that that happens today right. where, where there are side effects of people getting killed, sadly. But here is the thing is that um, that's not God's character. You know, now I'm jumping to a whole section on violence, but that is what I get attacked about the most I've realized very quickly is all of the violence and the slavery. Those are probably the two biggest yeah. ones that people jump to today. And, um, and I also, I use the illustration. In fact, when I spoke at your church, I played the video, Mary Poppins, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Scary the, Mary, uh, scary Mary one. <laughs> you know, there, if you looked up Google, scary Mary, and uh, it's a 60 second, uh, have you, have you seen this? Isaac? Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And someone, what they did was they took little scenes from the actual film, Mary Poppins, 
And it was ones where she's like looking mean out the window. And then they piece the, the other scene where there's uh, a wind comes and blows away all the nannies that were applying for her job. You know, she's in the room when they're actually having fun and singing a song all upbeat about cleaning up the room. And they take the shot of like the kid getting sucked into the closet and the door shut. And they piece together all these videos and put together one of the Mary Poppins songs to a slow, haunting soundtrack. And then by the end of it, it when you you'd, it says uh, "Scary Mary, hide your children," yeah. and you see the kids running. If I didn't know the real Mary Poppins, and if I didn't know the full movie, those are actual clips from the film. I would look at that sixty-second clip and think it's a horror film, and Mary is a scary person. And that's what's happening with the criticism of the violent stories is that we're pulling out some of the times when God did use violence. The cross is violent. I mean, you can't get around that there was violence. So there's no explaining that part away. Um, but what you don't see, it's not random, you know, kill everybody. You know, it's like this, uh, it's, it was used at times. And even the cross itself, the crux of our faith, was a violent, an yeah. act of violence that, that, that occurred. But it's not the way it's been characterized by a lot of the neo-atheists and and making God like this monster who's using it all the time and and no and absolutely not. But that those those are the two things that are probably the most difficult is the violence and the, and some of the slavery verses. When you have such a one of the most like disarming things in the entire book, there's so much humility and honesty to it. Is when you start the section on violence in the Old Testament, you say. This is the hardest thing to deal with, and I would much prefer to not write a chapter about this. But it belongs in the book, so I got to. Um, and I, I think that was so like honest of you and so disarming to the person who feels that way. You know what I mean? That they're going like, oh, he's, he's acknowledging that this is not just a, oh, it's easy, and if you just roll up your sleeves and read it, it's actually not that hard to understand. But you, you right out of the gate say, this is difficult. And I think that's a good lesson for every Christian here who talks to their friends and family about this. It's important that people know that you know that this is hard, that some of the stuff's hard to stomach and hard to believe and, and that you've, you're doing the work to understand it and it's not as crazy as it seems, but we're not going to pretend like it's easy, right? No, right. I mean, especially, I mean, most of the others there are, you can, I don't want to say explain them away, but you can have just, you know, there's reasons. The, the, the violence and, and the slavery, certain slavery verses are the, the most difficult ones. But like you said, it, you know that you, you talked about God's tweet that I mentioned yeah. earlier, you know, the saying the most commonly, uh, the common verse that God used describing himself, which is totally true, compassionate, loving, forgiving, you know, God. And, uh, and that's who he is. And when you see the full Bible storyline, you see that is who God is. And then I trust a God that at times had to use violence in a calculated way to accomplish things. And I will trust that he knows what he's doing. And I worship him, even though there was deaths involved in the, my savior, our savior was through a death. Yeah. And, um, you know, and here's what's going on though. This is what, this is madness because what goes on today with this is that we're seeing, um, one, there are certain types of Christians that'll just say, oh, well, God used violence, he can do whatever he wants, and good for that. Like, And I understand that, and that is what I would believe, God can do whatever he wants. But they should disturb people. You know, They should be like, wow, think about this. And so there's kind of like the callous, God can do everything you want, the heck with what people think, which again, I believe God can do whatever, whatever he wants. But then this is what's going on, and this is the part which is the most scary for Christians. Well, God could not a loving God would not have done those things. Right. So therefore the Bible is wrong in those places. It was the Israelites or whoever the authors were, were describing these things that didn't really happen. Then you get in an, into an entirely different understanding of what scripture is. The atonement becomes the child of God, you know, the father abusing his own son. And then it's an entirely different gospel an entirely different Jesus. And that's probably my biggest concern for the church today is in evangelical churches, especially younger people, they are not they since they're we are the most biblically illiterate time period right now. That's ha, you know with with people in the church, especially younger, that that certainly sounds appealing. Yeah, and it's a drift to um, distrust. I mean, a whole different view of the Bible, and then therefore you can come to all kinds of conclusions, which is actually ends up being a false gospel and a false Jesus. 
And that's why this is serious. And that is why I put the violence chapter in, because we got to just look at that. That's why I hope, you know, in the next six weeks with your church going through the book, I do hope for parents and grandparents uh, and for all ages, but they will be reading this and looking at this because these are the questions that are happening today. These, you know, even if it's not on memes, how people are looking at the Bible affects everything. All of the sexuality and gender questions is actually a how do you interpret the Bible question. Yeah. Most of the interpretations or that are being used, they're ignoring the Bible storyline. You know, it's just they're doing the same. They're guilty of the same thing of not doing their Bible storyline homework. And if you don't know the Bible, then it's easy to feel that's convincing. I'm going to go in this direction. And, um, you know, I'm all for it. That's why I love your church, because uh, you do this and you teach this normally. You have Theology Thursdays, you know, and that's why, to me, you're a model of what churches should be doing all the time. I just heard from, like, I think I'm starting to wake up from the Zevia. <laughs> <laughs> but at this, I just heard of a church who the pastor said something, I heard the second hand from a staff person, uh, but they said something like, they, they don't want to use too much Bible on Sundays because they don't want, you know, people that aren't Christians or, or to lose younger people. And yeah. to me, that's like insane madness. It should be the absolute opposite. And I am 100% convinced that the more we actually teach Bible, it is going to be of interest to both Christian and non-Christians the more we actually up the level of intelligence in the way we're teaching about it, I think that's going to up the level of respect and from non-Christians. To do the reverse, it's like whacked. So yeah. I can't, you know, that's why like if we're in entering a time period where we have to be teaching this all the more in our churches. So that's why I just hope this book will be helpful and stimulating uh, a conversation, hitting kind of the spicy topics of slavery and science and anti-women and all those things. Yeah, well, we, we could not agree with you more. Um, and that's why we're doing the series. That's And we why we're recommending the book to everybody on here. Grab it. And um, yeah, we could, we could easily talk to you for hours more. Um, we're already past time, believe it or not. That flew by. Um, so Dan, thank you so much. We, we so appreciate all of the work that you're doing, all of those cultural movements that you talked about at the beginning. I, you probably thought this too, Isaac, but all those cultural movements Dan talked about at the beginning of the interview, you've been on the forefront of all of them thinking through the implications sure. for the church, writing books, teaching, and, and helping Christians reason their way through cultural movements. So you are a gift to South Valley, but also to the church with a capital C. And we so appreciate you. Um, well, and you're a gift to me because I love hanging out with you guys and you inspire me. And I, it's great to know, like, we're in it together. So that's, um, I'm glad there's churches like you and may that be multiplied out there. Yeah. Amen. Anything else, Isaac, before we let people go? Kevin, hit the jingle. Yeah, hit the jingle. Thanks for being here, guys. Stick around for the rest of the series. Oh, that's not the jingle. There it is. Come Thanks on, so much. Kevin. Thanks so much for joining us. Night, everybody.